just let me know if you guys can see my screen and you can see the presentation. Yes, you can, you can see. Okay, thanks. So today we're gonna continue our discussion about uh, what we started uh, last lectures with wireless and networks and infrastructure. And we defined the physical layer for uh, our uh, devices. And we talked about briefly about antennas, propagation, uh, different standards for uh, physical communication between uh, devices. Now we're going to talk a bit more about protocols in uh, Internet of Things. But first and foremost, what is the Internet of Things? So IoT uh, is a paradigm, mostly, that involves uh, some sort of uh, network of connected devices that can uh, actually measure data from uh, their environment and also can actuate back into the environment. And usually they connect in uh, a sort of a network which is typically similar to or even uh, to the internet itself. So internet connected devices, they might range from sensors, appliances, RFID devices, you know, actuators, instruments, and so on. So you can even go to you know, smart light bulbs and sensors and uh, uh, very smart toasters. Um, the infrastructure that uh, was developed for such a network is very similar to the infrastructure developed for the internet because uh, the IoT uh, concept actually uh, was uh, developed quite uh, in parallel with the concept of the internet. So we are looking at networks that usually um, work on uh, IP protocols and one particularity of uh, Internet of Things is that it runs mostly on IPv6 instead of IPv4. Why is that? Because uh, typically you have a very large number of nodes. <clears throat> so nodes can range or networks can range from uh, tens to hundreds, to even thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, smart nodes. And then you need the proper addressing scheme, which IPv4 cannot necessarily offer. So uh, the switch was made directly to IPv6 in order to be future compatible. Uh, at the base of each network lie uh, these sensor nodes or modes as we defined them in our previous lectures, which typically are devices which are low cost. So uh, they typically use a processor which is uh, very cheap, 8, 16 or 32 bit architecture, mostly ARM architecture, but you can find also variations. And the size of them is typically small, uh, small size, small weight, very lightweight uh, devices. And usually they're also power efficient because uh, again, typically the applications rely on battery power. So not on grid power for most of the devices that are connected into a, an IoT network. So you would need to run from a couple of batteries uh, for a very, very long time. So usually months or even years between uh, uh, refreshing the batteries. Each node is uh, addressable within the networks. Uh, it's, it behaves very similarly to what a computer node uh, is in a standard computer network. So you can reach uh, a node, you can ping a node from uh, anywhere within the network and you can address uh, it. So it usually has a unique identifier or a unique address that you can uh, theoretically access from uh, anywhere within the network or if the network is connected to the internet, theoretically you can access it from anywhere from the internet. And again, being a, a system which is uh, deeply embedded into the real world, then you need some constraints which are typically around real-time usage. So uh, such a network is more responsive uh, and typically more uh, in tune to its environment than a standard computer network. So you have this uh, series of protocols and operating systems which are in, in essence real-time and they give you a real-time guarantee of uh, your actions within the network. 
<clears throat> now, in terms of what an IoT network typically needs, or what are the demands for an IoT network? Uh, there are, of course, uh, many particularities, but if uh, I have to draw a line and make some uh, uh, assessments of well, what are the things that are typically needed by all of them, uh, I think there are five uh, topics which are of uh, particular interest. One of them would be to this, this low power, low cost, uh, low memory footprint devices. So usually uh, in order to drive the cost down, you cannot use very powerful processors. Uh, so this is why the field is very constrained. Uh, you cannot uh, actually achieve a lot of computation on the node itself. We're not looking at processors which run at gigahertz or uh, they, uh, you know, they achieve uh, giga instructions per second. Usually we are looking at processors with uh, a frequency of around a few megahertz to a few tens maybe of megahertz. So uh, very low power, very efficient, but at the same time, very challenging to actually uh, achieve an application which is uh, computing intensive. So usually when uh, you need to, to do a real time application which actually requires some computation, you prefer to offload the, the computation from the network to uh, maybe connected server in the cloud and then uh, get, uh, get back the results. So it's typically uh, more effective in terms of cost to do this than to actually process everything on board for such a network. But again, there are some variations and there are a lot of flavors of IoT networks here. So uh, in general, this is a rule, but this rule might be broken by some systems. <clears throat> uh, I uh, said in the previous slide that most of the networks usually uh, employ uh, an addressing scheme and an IP protocol for routing of packets within the network. And that protocol mostly is IPv6 or IPv6 based. Now it depends on, uh, on the network and the capabilities of the nodes. Uh, usually when we're dealing with uh, low power and uh, low memory footprint devices, we're not employing uh, IPv6 per se. So we're not employing the whole IPv6 protocol. Uh, rather, we are employing a variant of the IPv6 protocol called 6 low path. It's an adaptation layer that actually translates IPv6 packets from the internet into a more lightweight protocol that also uses uh, uh, IPv6 addressing, but uh, it's uh, a lot, uh, a lot uh, less costly than uh, than IPv6 to implement. So you don't need a large memory footprint in your device to actually uh, have IPv6 uh, low band capabilities. So uh, you can look at it as a as an adaptation layer protocol between IPv6 and uh, the network itself. Uh, there's also a need for routing within these networks. So usually, uh, topologically speaking, the networks can be uh, can adopt a star topology where you have a central node which is always on, and then uh, some uh, some nodes which are disposed in the topology radially to uh, in regards to it. So you have a single hop between each node and the the gateway. Uh, which is a very simple topology and has a lot of benefits, uh, namely that you only have to have one node which is permanently on, and that's the, the central node, the gateway. Uh, and then, the, let's say, the leaf nodes, which are one hop away, they can be very low power as they can go to sleep whenever they wish. So you don't have, a, have to have a synchronization mechanism to actually keep the nodes uh, up at the same time or uh, duty cycle them synchronously. Um, when you have a mesh topology, so you have a, a sync node and then you have multiple paths, uh, two different leaves in the, uh, in the network. So you have multi hop networks, uh, then you need to complicate a bit, the, the topology and also complicate a bit, uh, the routing protocols that, uh, can actually make sure that you have efficient communication within the network. So this, this implies uh, you know, higher level of uh, redundancy within the network. You need to have multiple paths of uh, information transmission because nodes can fail, and then you can uh, actually disable entire parts of the network if uh, communication is routed through a node that uh, has actually failed. 
So through redundant paths and through routing protocols, uh, you actually can achieve a stable network or a high degree of quality within your network. But at the same time, uh, bear in mind that these devices have very limited uh, communication capabilities as well due to the constraints of cost and of uh, energy consumption. So usually we're talking about lossy networks. Uh, the radio communication environment usually is very crowded because we're talking about hundreds or maybe uh, thousands of, uh, uh, of receivers working at the same time within the network. And they can uh, they can actually incur a lot of noise within the and perturbations within the network. But at the same time, we are talking about very low cost radio transceivers. So there's uh, very little room for uh, error detection and correction. And there's also very limited bandwidth capabilities for, for each node. Um, when we're talking about these networks um, and developing them, we are talking about uh, usually new protocols, uh, which need to be lightweight due to the constraints of, of the devices themselves. We cannot run uh, version. Uh, you cannot actually run the protocols that are used in the typical computer network. Most of the protocols have uh, requirements which uh, outmatch what uh, we can do and what uh, you know the hardware capabilities of the devices themselves so new and lightweight application protocols have been developed some of them are similar to http and others are uh, are a bit different and we're going to go through each of them in the next slides and you'll see the differences uh, from uh, let's say the more established protocols in a computer network uh, and then we're talking about header compression. IPv6 usually does not fit within a uh, 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 typical packet for uh, the most uh, used standard in IoT networks. The most used standard is uh, 802.15.4. And uh, the 802.15.4 MAC does not, uh, is not compatible with IPv6 at all. So this is why we need the, this adaptation layer for six low path. Now, where do we find IoT networks? Well, I'm just going to go through a few of the um, applications of IoT networks. Uh, first, this this concept of smart city, uh, which has grown exponentially with uh, the past uh, 10 or 15 years. So we are looking at um, deployment of uh, IoT networks within uh, a city or uh, within uh, you know, a smaller town which can actually uh, incur a lot of uh, data gathering from uh, different utilities, environments, um, street lighting, um, public safety, um, energy measurement, traffic management, and so on. So you can you get to measure a lot of uh, parameters from the environment of, uh, of a city. Uh, and these can uh, these parameters can be measured by different systems uh, which are implemented by different companies but they're all together they aggregate to form this this idea of a smart city and then you have uh, then you have uh, different organizations such as uh, the the city management or the planning authorities which can actually benefit from gathering this data so they can improve health for example or uh, education or traffic within the uh, within the city or public safety and so on so this concept is does not only relate to a single network implemented for example in a building it relates to the, um, hundreds maybe thousands of networks which are interconnected and they interoperate at the level of a city to actually get this uh, uh, fully connected experience and also social networking plays a part in this uh, the smart city. So not only you measure the, the environmental parameters, but also you measure the social parameters of a city through a, uh, such an IoT network. Uh, another application which is quite interesting and uh, has grown a lot in the past years is environmental monitoring. Uh, so you can and employ IoT networks to monitor, constantly monitor parameters in the environment. So you can have, for example, uh, a device installed in your home or in each room of your house to actually measure parameters such as temperature, humidity, 
uh, leaky pipes, uh, noise, uh, gas and smoke uh, and particulate matter, for example, which is uh, very typical to measure right now within Bucharest. Uh, and to actually have uh, this experience of um, alerting uh, the user of uh, uh, a situation where a parameter can uh, can uh, be uh, outside of a measured range, or you have a dashboard and the reporting structure of uh, a history of how these parameters have varied uh, uh, over time. And this, of course, brings another level of information uh, over, the, uh, over the, a typical system. And you can also tie this one to uh, different actuators and different uh, other services which can, uh, uh, can actually improve your, uh, uh, your environment. In energy distribution, again, IoT plays a key role. Because you have uh, not only uh, energy distribution, but also energy production. And this has started to become more and more prevalent uh, within, uh, within energy grids. Uh, so you can have also uh, monitoring of the, the production, but also the consumption of energy. So anything from smart meters installed in your house that actually get and send the, the energy consumption data regularly to your uh, energy service provider, but also uh, meters that uh, that monitor the production of energy, be it from uh, regenerable sources such as wind or solar, or they can actually aggregate and measure the energy production at uh, country level. So you can. Uh, uh, you can you can actually see in real time the energy production of uh, of Romania, for example, over another country. Um, then there are um, IoT networks which are uh, prevalent to uh, supply chain, and uh, they can enable continuous and real time supply chain visibility for uh, tracking and uh, uh, for management of different commercial assets. And these usually are done over uh, wireless networks. Uh, so GSM, LTE is prevalent here. You have fleet management, for example, in different companies which uh, need to track the real-time location of, uh, of their cargo, uh, and you need to monitor the condition and status. Uh, and then you can, you can get analytics and you can see what you can improve in the delivery of this or the shipment of your, uh, your, uh, your merchandise. So again, it's it's an area where real-time monitoring uh, can be achieved through these networks, and it's a world of advantage from uh, from the past when you did not necessarily know uh, at any moment where your fleet of uh, cargo was and what are what the operational cost. You could only uh, incur them through other means. There's also a very powerful penetration of uh, IoT into the industrial sector. Uh, you have uh, this paradigm of uh, industrial IoT, which uh, actually means you, you employ IoT networks within a factory or within, uh, within a production facility to actually improve uh, the, the production quality, to improve the yield, and to minimize your costs. So basically, you who have smart devices from machines and uh, different sensors, tools, and so on, which gather data about their usage. And then through uh, machine learning, through analytics, you get different, uh, different statistics about how the particular tool was used, uh, you know, what's its uh, degree of uh, wear, and uh, what can you actually improve to, in order to, to actually achieve a better quality of your production. For example, you can better train your, uh, uh, your staff uh, to, to actually handle these tools. You can actually devise new uh, procedures for production and so on. So it's, uh, it's also uh, uh, very important regarding to safety of the, of the personnel that are working in the industrial environment. So uh, you can uh, you can detect some faulty conditions. For example, if a worker has forgotten uh, their um, 
equipment, uh, so or they are not properly wearing their equipment, their protection equipment at work, you can actually take that erroneous condition immediately and you can take uh, corrective action. So these are, let's say, some of the main uses of uh, IoT that have permeated through our society and through our uh, technology and production uh, lines. But uh, these are only a few, to say the least. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's an ever-expanding uh, field. And uh, what we're going to see probably in the next years is uh, uh, an explosion of IoT applications all around us. So technically speaking, networking is a key component to uh, these devices. So you have different layers of networking, which some of them you are familiar with because we are going to be talking a lot about the ISO OC stack. Uh, but uh, we are we're also going to speak a lot about addressing of these devices because they are forming a network which uh, form uh, addressable structures and addressable nodes within the network. So schemes such as IPv4 or IPv6 networks are very uh, typical to, to IoT with uh, a local flavor of course as i told you ipv6 is uh, rarely used as it is and it's uh, mostly used over six low band we're talking about data transmission so different protocols for data transmission from uh, wi-fi 5g lte uh, zigbee and so on some of them we've uh, uh, we've touched on in the past lectures and we will talk more about them also in the future we're talking about transfer speeds, which are usually limited. So uh, most of IoT networks, which uh, run in different applications, employ a uh, transfer speed of a few kilobytes per second to maybe a few megabytes per second. But, but we are also uh, seeing uh, uh, some applications where a high bandwidth is needed, such as video surveillance and monitoring and the different multimedia and real-time applications which require a, a large amount of bandwidth so we're we're even going to up to gigabits per second for some of the devices uh, in an iot network uh, and then you have media and control uh, as uh, as a layer in your stack so you have the mac layer or the data link layer which is crucial to implementing uh, uh, such an infrastructure and such a network and you Usually also on top of that, you have other protocols which are application level or uh, which can connect different IoT networks geographically. So you can span your network across multiple geographies, uh, different countries or even different continents. So you have protocols such as CoAP and MQTT, which uh, can easily connect uh, to IoT islands together, or they can aggregate data from different IoT islands, and you can have them available at your disposal. Um, now, we've talked about the, the ISO OC layer, and this is a short comparison of how the OC layers uh, differ from, uh, let's say, a typical computing application and a typical computer network, and you have this, this stack in the on the left side of the screen, and then you have an IoT layer. Uh, like I told you, it's an adaptation of uh, different protocols, and they are suited typically for an IoT network. So you have this uh, uh, this correspondence. You have different uh, different protocols and different, uh, of course, layers. From the physical layer, you have the you know 802.3 and 802.11 physical layer for most computer networks. Uh, for IoT applications, the 802.15.4 uh, standard is prevalent, so you're going to see a lot of 802.15.4 networks. But also in the in the last uh, years, 802.11, so the, the the standard which Wi-Fi is based on, has permeated more and more into the IoT domain. <clears throat> Why? Because uh, in the past. Wi-Fi was uh, very uh, energy intensive, so you needed uh, a lot of bandwidth, uh, but you also uh, depleted your batteries really fast if you're using Wi-Fi. Uh, nowadays, uh, there's been a you know great development in uh, very energy uh, or low power um, transceivers, 
<clears throat> which can actually use 802.11 on a regular basis and they don't draw such uh, huge amount of power from uh, from your battery so they're not going to deplete your battery anytime soon of course when you're using a relatively low bandwidth uh, of uh, communication when uh, you increase the bandwidth then uh, you're, you're going to drain the battery fast as well so uh, at the Mac level, you you get again 802.3 and 802.11, uh, and here you have the 802.15.4 Mac for IoT applications. Now on the IP layer, you have IPv4 and IPv6 protocols for computer networks. Here you have the six low pan adaptation layer, which actually is uh, is used in the wide range of uh, of networks. And then moving on, uh, you see you have different protocols here for uh, for routing. Uh, RPL is uh, very typical of uh, of IoT networks. Uh, you use this for uh, for routing protocol over lossy networks, uh, and it's uh, it's employed by a lot of IoT solutions. Uh, whereas uh, you know if in um, Typical computer networks you use TCP as a transport protocol or UDP. Here you would much rather prefer it to be stateless. So uh, UDP is preferred over TCP in uh, IoT networks. You don't see a lot of TCP implementations in, in IoT networks. Uh, you would need to keep it, uh, you know, keep the communication as simple as possible, uh, a few handshakes and uh, just um, receive and transmit uh, information in a, in a device, in a network. So UDP is, uh, is better suited to such a uh, communication because it's stateless. Uh, and then on the top of the application layer, you have HTTP, FTP, and so on, which uh, have formed the backbone of, uh, of the internet as we know it. Here you have co-op and QTT and other application layer protocols which are uh, employed on a large scale in IoT networks. And we're gonna spend a few minutes to talk about the most prevalent uh, protocols which are used in, in IoT networks. Um, so that's gonna be the, the discussion for the next slides. Now, just to, to draw, let's say a finishing line and uh, to, to actually talk a bit about what the characteristics are for, for such networks, usually when it, yeah, it comes to, to communication within an IoT network. Uh, it's very similar in concept to a communication uh, of uh, a standard, let's say, computer network, where you have packets being routed through the network itself. But typically in an IoT network, the dimension of the packets is smaller than, uh, than a typical computer network. So you have small packet size uh, because also, the bandwidth is very limited. So you have maybe tens to hundreds of kilobits per second in a typical IoT network instead of uh, maybe megabits or gigabits per second in a computer network. Uh, the topology can vary. Um, most of the, the IoT networks have a star topology where you have a central node and then you have uh, nodes distributed radially uh, within the network, so a single hop network because it's very simple to implement. So you don't need to have advanced routing protocols through the network. And uh, usually when the nodes are uh, very low cost, uh, you don't need to, to employ uh, you know, a lot of software to actually keep them awake for long periods of time to route the, the information through the network. Uh, but you also have applications where uh, mesh topology is employed. So you have uh, devices that send the information uh, through uh, a mesh structure and you can disseminate packets in the network very similarly to what you have in a, in a computer network. Low power battery operated is, uh, is a given to these networks. And this is usually driven by a very low cost. Uh, we're talking about maybe tens, hundreds, or thousands of uh, such nodes. So uh, uh, a low cost of uh, a device is uh, is a big incentive to actually develop these networks. Uh, you're not going to have, uh, you know, the costs are going to skyrocket if you have a device which costs uh, $100 or the $1,000 device, you cannot deploy it in a, uh, in a very efficient, cost efficient manner if you have a network of thousands of such devices. So you need a, the device cost to be around maybe dollars or tens of dollars. Uh, 
it's usually in terms of how they organize, they organize ad hoc. So the device has some limited accessibility. You cannot have full uh, accessibility schemes to your device. And it's usually done over an unreliable wireless medium of communication where packets can be lost and you have a lot of interference and you have a lot of noise affecting your communication channel. So when is a device suitable for IoT? When can you say that uh, this device is better suited to an IoT network and this device is not? Well, you need to have an adaptation layer or the device needs to run some sort of adaptation layer or have at least the capability to do so. Uh, and this is usually around six low pan. So that, that adaptation protocol, which translates IP headers into uh, headers that can be packets that can be routed through an 802.15.4 network. Because there's no method yet to run IP over uh, such, a, such a network. Uh, why? It's really easy because the MTU for IPv6 is larger than the packet size for 802.15.4 networks. So you cannot directly run it, but you can actually adapt IPv6 to run over it through six low pan. So again, security for uh, these networks need to be, needs to be taken into consideration. We haven't touched security yet, but as you can imagine, if the costs are low and the capabilities, the computing capabilities of the devices are very low, then you, you cannot typically run uh, the security measures and protocols that run on a, uh, on a computer network. So you are very limited in your options for installing and ensuring security in your network. And usually it's, it's considered to be uh, at times less secure than a typical computer network. Uh, so you need to take extra care when you're handling uh, sensitive data and you're communicating that data over for uh, a mesh topology. Now, 802.15.4 is the standard. Uh, now, uh, the packet size, the maximum packet size for uh, communication in such a network is 128 bytes. That includes max. So uh, the payload itself is around 100 bytes, 103 bytes to be more precise. Uh, it uses 64-bit uh, addresses. Uh, and has a provision for smaller, shorter addresses of 16-bit uh, length. Uh, you can support multiple topologies through it, so you can easily support star or mesh network topologies. And data rates typically span between uh, a few tens of kilobits per second to a few hundreds of kilobits per second. Maximum uh, of the standard is 250 kilobits per second. And the range of which you have uh, effective communication between devices can be between 10 meters and 30 meters maximum. So you cannot send data uh, over uh, across larger distances. Maybe with more powerful transceivers, you can achieve hundreds or even kilometers for uh, for it to that 15.4. But these are special cases. Usually, it, it's uh, it's between nodes that are in line of sight, direct line of sight. Uh, why do you use IPv6 for this? And why is IPv6 so, um, so, so attractive to, to IoT networks? Well, IPv6 is more suitable to a high density of nodes within your network. Uh, you need, and typically IoT applications, they employ tens or hundreds of, of these nodes. Um, again, when you have low power and low computing capabilities, as simple as possible is uh, usually regarded as a plus. So uh, stateless usually is mandated in, in such networks. Um, again, because you have a 64-bit a address scheme, then no NAT is necessary. So you don't need to have network address translation. Each node can have a unique address and can be identified uniquely within the internet itself which is uh, a very cool uh, feature to have within your network. Uh, and of course, it's future compatible. So you have a possibility of adding innovative techniques uh, such as addressing, which is location aware within your network uh, after you have actually deployed your network. And so, uh, of course, there are some, uh, there are some cons as well. So uh, larger address width is one of them. You handle packets a bit more, uh, um, or a bit less efficient than you would with uh, with an IPv4 addressing scheme. Uh, 
Uh, you need to comply, of course, with IPv6 node requirements. So IPsec, for example, is mandated in such networks. Uh, you, you cannot actually uh, run over it. So considerations would be how much it would cost to deploy such a network. Uh, that's crucial in, in some areas. Imagine you have um, a network of uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of these nodes and you want to spread them geographically across, I don't know, uh, a mountain range or a forest or something like this when you're doing environmental monitoring, then you would need to drive the cost of such a deployment to a minimum. Uh, so you, you need to probably have devices which cost cents or dollars in order for, for this to uh, to actually be economically feasible. Uh, then you have a time to market constraint, which is uh, typical to any product, not only IoT devices. So you, you need to minimize your time to market. Uh, there's also a high degree of complexity when you're deploying such a network. Uh, and the complexity is given not by the device itself, but by the fact that they need to establish between themselves a communication network, which is effective. So <clears throat> high availability of the network is, uh, is a given. Uh, you need to achieve that in order for, for the application to be successful. Uh, there are, of course, hazards due to different types of error, and human error is one of them. And you also need to scale the, the infrastructure of your network. So you, know, you need your network to be able to scale properly for, uh, for future applications. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, then moving on, uh, we're going to talk a bit about communication protocols within IoT. And we're going to start with link layer protocols. These are some of the, the most uh, heavily used link layer protocols in IoT networks. So we're talking about 802.3 Ethernet, 802.11, which is uh, actually the, the backbone for Wi-Fi, 802.16. Uh, it might be used in, in some networks, uh, though it's not as prevalent. Uh, so this is, the again, the standard for WiMAX. Uh, but most of them usually are employed over 802.15.4. So this is a uh, low data rate uh, wireless personal area network or LTE, some sort of LTE communication, when you have nodes which are spread geographically across wide distances. So you don't have meters between your devices, you might have kilometers or even tens of kilometers between your devices, then it's much easier to use uh, mobile communication. Again, the communication cost here is a factor and the cost can be uh, financial and also it can be in energy. So you need a lot more energy to actually keep alive a node that has uh, you know, these LTE communication capabilities. Network layer protocols, uh, typically you find uh, some networks which uh, use actually IPv4, but uh, as you well know, the, the pool of uh, public uh, IP addresses for 32 bits has been exhausted in 2011. So uh, the internet is slowly switching to IPv6 uh, with its 128 bit addresses. And then you have the six low band, which is, uh, let's say, compression, a compression mechanism for IPv6 over 802.15.4. So you can, you can take packets in, uh, in IPv6 and you can route them uh, efficiently in an 802.15.4 network. Uh, transport layer protocols, uh, you have TCP and you have UDP, there's no, uh, uh, no surprise here. Um, TCP is not as preferred as UDP in, uh, in an IoT network because UDP is stateless, as I told you. So there's no, no need for a uh, you know, uh, complicated handshake between uh, uh, devices when they're communicating. Uh, it's a lot simpler to implement than TCP, and usually uh, it's IoT friendly because of that. Now, application layer is where uh, a lot of the protocols that differ from, uh, from the typical computer network have been implemented. And these are, uh, I just want to go through a few of them, maybe in order of, uh, of preference and in order of uh, prevalence within uh, the, the networks it's themselves. So just going to start with HTTP. You know, HTTP is 
the hypertext transport uh, protocol that uh, we all uh, know and love and it's used in the internet per se but it's also found a home in uh, different iot networks so you have um, uh, different levels of implementation for this protocol within your iot network usually you don't need to, to implement all the commands in, in http maybe a subset of them so maybe you only have get and put uh, commands in uh, in a node you don't need more capabilities than this you only need to get data and to post data uh, it's employed because again as uh, udp itself it's stateless so each request is different than uh, than another request you have a request and a reply and that's that uh, an HTTP client can be a browser or an application, so you can directly connect to your uh, sensor node or your device through your browser, or you can uh, you can actually have an application which uh, aggregates multiple devices and they can communicate over HTTP with them. Uh, and you have the of course the MIME uh, system, which is typical to HTTP, which is, can also be easily employed uh, for uh, for devices. Co-app Co is a specialized internet application protocol for constrained devices. It's, uh, it stands for constrained application protocol. Uh, it enables constrained, these constrained devices, they're called you know, the nodes in your uh, wireless sensor network, to communicate with the uh, wider the internet using uh, similar protocols. So it's designed for use between devices on the same constrained network, low power, lossy network, networks such as uh, such as the, the ones we've been discussing so far and uh, between devices and general nodes on the internet uh, you have usually an architecture where uh, typically you get these nodes which are connected over co-op in your local network local iot network and then you connect to a gateway that is connected to the internet itself so uh, this is why it's uh, usually it's called machine to machine communication uh, and it's a very simple model of a request response uh, similar to what you have in, in http you can have this protocol and you can also have even uh, even plugins uh, that uh, you can connect to your network through your local browser for example like uh, like a plugin for firefox or for chrome uh, it's a service layer protocol. It's intended in resource-constrained internet devices, uh, and it's designed to easily translate to HTTP for simplified integration with uh, the web. Uh, but it can also have some uh, some features which uh, are uh, uh, specialized, such as multicast support and very low overhead and uh, very simple uh, connection scheme. So it runs UDP instead of TCP at a lower level. And you have these methods which are very similar to the methods employed by HTTP. So you get, uh, you have get, you have put, you have post, you have delete and so on. So you can query the, the capabilities of the network and you can query you know, the number of nodes which are connected to the IoT network and you can query the capabilities of each node itself. And you can, you can discover uh, these capabilities and then you can you can actually interrogate them or you can send messages to the node and uh, it will uh, it will connect and it will actuate now web sockets again it's a paradigm which you probably have used in a typical computer network it's uh, you're using sockets when, whenever you need to communicate between two peers in a, in a network uh, usually a client and a server, uh, you connect the client to the server through a WebSocket and uh, it offers full duplex communication uh, for sending and receiving data. So you have here a simple uh, idea of how the handshake is done between the client and the server. And then, uh, you know, messages are sent bidirectionally between them at application level. But this one is TCP based. So it's not as used as uh, HTTP and co-app within uh, wireless sensor networks, uh, but you can you can actually see it when uh, you have nodes which have higher computing capabilities than uh, than usual. Uh, 
So the client can be a browser or a device or a mobile application and so on. You can you can actually use this easily uh, within those situations. MQTT uh, stands for Message Queue Telemetry Transport, and uh, it's a different protocol. Uh, this one is uh, also lightweight. It stands over a published subscribe network uh, architecture. Uh, so you have this paradigm of uh, nodes that can publish information into a central server, and then you, you have uh, also devices that can connect to that server and subscribe to the feeds of, uh, of the nodes. Uh, usually it runs over TCP IP, but uh, it's also an implementation which can be run over lossy networks uh, such as, uh, such as uh, IoT networks. Uh, it's designed for connections with remote locations where a resource constraint exists or the network bandwidth is very limited. So uh, it's, it's an open protocol. It was historically developed by uh, IPM uh, uh, in, I think, 99. Uh, and it was originally used to monitor uh, industrial uh, applications such as SCADA and pipeline, uh, oil pipeline and industrial control applications. Uh, it's very energy efficient. It's very lightweight. Uh, it uses very little battery power in order to, to communicate. And this is why uh, MQTT and CoAP are the, I think, the two most prevalent application layer protocols in IoT networks today. MQTT is, uh, is deployed over a wide, very wide range of, uh, of applications in IoT. Uh, most of them are automotive. So Internet of Vehicles is another paradigm here that, uh, that is very uh, much uh, catching right now. Uh, and uh, we're going to probably talk a lot more about CoAP and MQTT in our next lectures. So we have this structure here of a, of a server, a central server or broker, which aggregates data from uh, different uh, nodes that actually can uh, publish data to it. So you have, for example, a temperature sensor, which publishes data to this broker, to the MQTT broker, uh, with the topic name temperature, and then you have the payload of, uh, of the message itself, which is, can be regularly updated. And then you have different uh, devices, which subscribe to the, this topic, this particular topic on the MQTT broker. And you get the, the measured data from the temperature sensor. So it's, it's one to many. Uh, in this regard, it's a public subscribe uh, type of uh, type of interaction between the devices themselves. Of course, you can have multiple devices which can publish uh, different topics on the MQTT broker. And again, a device can subscribe to multiple feeds in the MQTT broker. So it's very flexible regarding this. You can you can have a lot of complexity added to uh, to this MQTT network with a very small overhead. Uh, uh, the next one is uh, XMPP, which stands for Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol. Uh, it was originally named Jabber, uh, if you probably heard about this. Uh, it's an open communications protocol, but it's designed for instant messaging, presence information, contact list maintenance, and so on. Uh, it's used in IoT, but usually used in IoT uh, applications which are more computing intensive. So uh, it's interesting because it offers real-time communication between uh, devices and it streams XML data between different network elements, such as clients and servers. So it's a client-server topology, as you, you, you can see in, the, in this uh, uh, picture here, and it's suitable for voice and video chat messaging. Uh, and it's widely used in gaming and multi-party chat applications. It's designed to be extensible. The protocol offers a multitude of applications beyond traditional instant messaging and uh, voice and video chat application. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, the broader realm of message-oriented middleware, uh, including signaling for voice over IP, video, file transfer gaming, and other uh, different applications. Uh, XMPP is defined as an open standard. 
uh, in the application layer. So you can uh, you can employ it in different uh, types of uh, applications. Um, the architecture of uh, the network itself is very similar to what uh, the architectures of, of, of email is uh, at this point. So anyone can run uh, an XMPP server and there's no central master server for it. So you can have communications, uh, as you see here, between different servers in the network. Okay, and then you have, we have DDS. Uh, DDS stands for Data Distribution Service. It's uh, for, it's oriented for uh, real-time systems, such as object management group, machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communication. Uh, it aims to enable dependable, high-performance, uh, interoperable, real-time, uh, scalable data exchanges. Uh, and it's using a publish subscribe pattern as well as MQTT. So it, uh, it uses the same pub sub model where you have multiple publishers and multiple subscribers in a, in a very similar fashion to, to what MQTT is offering. But uh, you have uh, other features which make it uh, you know, very flexible. Uh, it addresses the needs of applications like uh, aerospace and uh, air traffic control, for example, autonomous vehicles vehicles, robotics, power generation, medical devices, uh, simulation, testing, smart grid management. Uh, it, it, it can encompass a, a wide range of applications where, uh, you know, there's critical data being handled by the network. Security is also a very big issue. And uh, you can have uh, uh, reliability, which is configurable and quality of service, which is also uh, configurable. Okay, and then you have uh, AMQP. AMQP stands for uh, Advanced Message Queuing Protocol. Uh, it, it's an open standard application layer protocol for message-oriented middleware. Uh, the defining features of, of it are uh, message orientation. So it's, it's message oriented. You have a broker and you have uh, publishers and consumers. Um, you have queuing of messages, you have routing including point-to-point, -point, publish, subscribe, uh, and so on, reliability, and also security. Uh, it uh, mandates the behavior of messaging uh, provider and client to the extent that implementations from different vendors are interoperable. So in the same was, uh, way as HTTP and FTP work, for example. Uh, so you have this you have this network where you uh, usually exchange packets uh, between a publisher and a subscriber. You have a broker which actually creates uh, an exchange server and, and then different message queues, and uh, a consumer can subscribe to a particular message queue. So whenever a consumer joins the broker, a queue is created, and you can subscribe to this queue and uh, have uh, you know either send messages or request messages from the from the network. Okay, so in the next lectures, we're gonna talk a lot about uh, different functional blocks or different layers of IoT functionality. So we have talked a lot about uh, communication now. We've talked a lot about maybe application protocols, and we've. Uh, we went through the most uh, let's say used application protocols within an IoT network. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, the, I think, the two most used ones, CoAP and MQTT, in our next slides, not next lectures. Uh, but we're also going to talk a bit about management of, uh, of these networks. We're going to talk about devices and device capabilities, services, and also communication. So these are these are the main building blocks when you are talking about IoT. Okay, I guess this was uh, this was it for for today's lecture. If you guys have questions, okay, not thank you very much. Let's pray for uh, 